have a little humorous title. You can guess where the spinoff came from that. Better Lawns and Gardens. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I don't have a problem with that. Amen, right? <laughs> so, I guess I'm pressing my own thing here. Um, first, a little history on the lawn. We take things for granted. In the little film you just saw, I, I call lawns a, a convention. Well, they are a uh, convention that is only about 60 years old, and it, it started with a chemical, uh, the chemical industry because the lawn was not possible. Uh, a monoculture of grass growing without weeds was not possible without the petrochemical industry. So we can thank the pe petrochemical industry for the modern lawn, but uh, now we need to rethink that uh, paradigm. And it's interesting that uh, initially when lawns were coming into fashion, uh, the, the seed mix you, was not a monoculture. The seed mix was not pure grass. It contained things such as white clover because clover is an important nitrogen fixer and it, it helps the grass grow so you wouldn't have to even have fertilizers if you had natural um, legumes and things that grew side by side with the grasses. Uh, clover is also an important pollinating plant. I'm a beekeeper and I happen to like uh, clover honey among other types of honey. So I thank everybody who grows clover and it's really hard to be a beekeeper in suburbia. In fact, studies have shown that in Detroit, with all its uh, vacant land and weeds that are growing, it, the bees are actually more productive in the urban Detroit than they are in, in the suburban areas outside of Detroit. So we need more people to supply the pollen and nectars that are, will aid our pollinators. And another one is dandelions. Dandelions, I say they fix themselves over time. Dandelions can be a source of food, but they bring nutrients such as calcium up to the surface and making it more bioavailable for other plants. And so it actually helps the grass in the long run to have dandelions, just like clover. The clover and the dandelions actually help the health of the grasses. Now, if you're spraying herbicide to kill the dandelion, it's actually a fool's game. You're chasing, it's like a chase snaking its own tail. So the paradigm of monoculture is what some of us are fighting against, and that's because nature loves biodiversity, and so and ecosystems depend on it. So what you're doing is you're just spending an awful lot of effort fighting the, the natural system that God created that wants to do its own thing. So what kinds of household products are we using? We're using fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, and over 100 million pounds of chemicals are used in the United States each year on our lawns. And I said, look at Beyond Pesticides website. I'll, I'll give some citations in this presentation that are good to look at because it's limited how much I can say without putting you to sleep. And it's, I found it interesting that Europe, under the REACH, R-E-A-C-H, uh, is switching to a precautionary principle approach, whereas here the burden of safety for these chemicals is placed on us. I mean, basically, the chemical industry is not required to do very much testing. Unlike the FDA, when you have uh, the federal, uh, the drugs that are approved go through ex you know, maybe a billion dollars worth of testing before they go on the market, and even then sometimes we find out that they're not good for us. Isn't that true? So imagine that these chemicals have ver uh, used externally. They're not supposed to get in our bodies, so they're not tested for that. And obviously they do get into our body. Any chemical that is ever made or used gets distributed throughout the environment and finds their way into our food, drinking water, the air we breathe, and it gets in, inside of us. So it's not really fair that we as citizens with our limited resources would have to challenge these uh, uh, deep-pocketed uh, corporations on the safety of their chemicals after they've already been used and then years down the line found to have some toxic effects. So what can we do? Uh, we need to really change the way we think and uh, change our paradigm, change our habits. You've heard the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, and there, I think there's five or six, there's new words that are coming out to go along with that um, environmentalist para, uh, mantra. And that is, re, one of them is refuse, refuse to buy toxic products. So uh, the corporations have all the power otherwise. You know, what power do we have? Uh, litigation is one of our only um, tools that we can use to try to stop this poisoning of our environment and of our bodies. 
but that's very expensive and time consuming and very difficult. And there are very few lawsuits that um, ever see the light of day, as you know. And so we can vote with our pocketbook. That's pretty much the biggest power we have is to make the decision ourselves not to use these chemicals or limit their use. Now, one thing that is used on American lawns is fertilizer. And uh, I cite some different things here. NASA scientists estimate that lawn runoff contributes up to 20% of water pollution that causes the dead zone at the basin of the Mississippi River in the Gulf of Mexico. So I mentioned in the little film, the Love Your Lawn film, that eutrophication is, um, when it's man-made, eutrophication can be a natural word, but it means an overproduction of plant growth, like algae blooms. And when we dump, when, our, when we put fertilizer and it washes into our streams, it makes its way into the river and down to the ocean. And what happens is the, all the algae, when it grows, those cells eventually die and then bacteria break down that biomass. And as the bacteria break down the biomass, they consume the oxygen in the water. Well, fish don't thrive when there's no oxygen. So that's why it's called dead zone. It's not the, the plants, plants produce oxygen, but when the plant tissue dies and the bacteria break it down, it sucks out the oxygen. Another problem is some of the nitrates that are in the water from fertilizers, and that can cause blue baby syndrome, and it's also toxic to developing fetuses. Um, you all know that uh, developing organisms and infants and juveniles of any species tend to be more vulnerable because they're developing, their cells are dividing fast, and mistakes that are made to the, to the uh, developing um, child or infant uh, can manifest in many different health effects. Another thing that people don't think about is that uh, fertilizers in lawn use and in agriculture in general contribute significantly to the climate change issue. They are, the nitrous oxide is a global warming, a potent global warming gas and more potent than carbon dioxide. We're not emitting as much as we're emitting carbon dioxide, but it's a, a fairly significant contribution. And just from lawns, it's about three to five percent of the nitrogen that you apply to your lawn is converted to this global warming gas. Another issue is ammonia and fertilizers. Ammonia is toxic. It's pH dependent, but ammonium and ammonia are the different forms. And so ammonia is toxic to all fish at a certain a pretty low concentration. And so that's another concern that we're, what is the trade-off of applying these fertilizers to have a big lush lawn when we're, we're killing off fish? And the other thing is that there are other toxic byproducts in fertilizer. Now it depends on the source of the fertilizer. There's all sorts of different kinds of fertilizers, but fertilizers have been studied and, and they've been documented to contain um, sometimes heavy metals, arsenic, for example, it would be toxic, or, or even dioxins in some cases. So it depends on where the fertilizer is coming from. And we use, um, believe it or not, a lot of people don't know this, but sewage sludge uh, is often used as fertilizer, ground into the dirt in Michigan, here in Michigan, and to farmers' fields. And where does the sewage sludge come from? That can include hospital waste with drugs. That can include agricultural waste, again, with uh, all kinds of uh, veterinary drugs and antibiotics. And that's why we're getting antibiotic strains of microbes, because they are being dosed consistently with these drugs. So it's not a good thing. Now, even though bacteria can break some of these things down, you have to look at the turnaround time. The turnaround time is not sufficient break this all down during the sewage process, treatment process or even in the, from the time you put it in the field to the time you're growing the food, uh, some of these toxins get, in, get into our food. Uh, this is the funniest thing. The use of fertilizer can create its own dependency. I call it your, your lawn on crack. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, fertilizer, if it's applied too thickly, if too abundantly, you can actually, it creates, it heats up the soil and can kill the healthy microbes. Soil is supposed to be a living organism. Soil, a, a scoop of uh, soil should have billions of microbes in it, all kinds of uh, springtails and, and maybe earthworms and d different organisms. And you may be killing your uh, healthy microbes 
and other organisms by adding fertilizer, especially if you add too much. And it can also create uh, what's called cementification, chemical reactions that, that harden the soil. The soil becomes more chalky or, or um, hard and uh, rocky, more, less organic matter. The other, it's also the way that we grow things. But the natural selection for uh, grass is resistant to high, you can actually um, add things to your grass like uh, that to either foster the growth of weeds or, or impede the growth of weeds relative to the growth rate of your grass with a certain nitrogen phosphorus ratio. So I think somebody else mentioned always have your soil tested because we're adding these things on that just out of habit or because we think it's going to improve the lawn and it may not even be necessary. For example, in Michigan, phosphorus is usually not limiting. So you usually do not need to add phosphorus and you don't usually need to add nitrogen or phosphorus unless you have a, a brand new lawn if you have dirt and you're seeding the lawn for the first time maybe. But usually you won't even need to add the fertilizer. People just do it out of habit. Then you ruin the soil, and sometimes can ruin the soil with too many nutrients, and now you have to add more to get the grass to grow. So it's crack lawn, addicted to fertilizer. Uh, I say put it in rehab by using organic compost. If you use organic compost, you can rehabilitate the crack lawn. And how do you do that? Well, natural fertilizers uh, can be made. Uh, there are different types of composting. You probably have learned some of the techniques. One is just um, create a giant compost pile with lawn clippings, dried out weeds, cardboard, food waste. And usually you have, you have your greens and your browns, like dried vegetation is brown or, or cardboard, and then green is the fresher uh, lawn clippings or, or um, old salad or other vegetables in your refrigerator that you don't want, you can throw in there. And a ratio of about one-third green to two-thirds brown is a nice mixture of the carbon and nitrogen. And then you can stick a, a turkey base, a thermometer into the pile, and when it exceeds 130 degrees, it will kill certain weed seeds and pathogens. And you can aerate, uh, stick something in the compost pile or turn it over periodically to aerate and keep it moist because all organisms need water, right? So once you create the comp uh, compost, and it may take a long time to break down, which the finished product will no longer be hot because the microbes have burned themselves out, and the, it should have no odor of sulfur, ammonia, or garbage, or fecal, or any of those uh, unpleasant odors. It should have a light, earthy, or sweet odor. And it should have the consistency of soil when it's done. Um, well, actually, for um, I do vermiculture, and that's it, they don't like that. So it depends on what you're using in your compost. When I do vermiculture, we don't uh, they don't like the um, I think it may be toxic or the acidity is not. I'm not sure what it is about citrus that they don't like. Yeah. Right? Doesn't they don't like it? Yeah. Yeah, another thing about the compost pile that I didn't mention on the screen is you need to inoculate it with good, healthy soil or some microbes. You've got to have the biota in it to break it down. So you can, if you have some healthy soil, you can get that started in your compost. And vermiculture, I do, I keep a, a worm condominium. <laughs> and I can throw all my kitchen waste in there except for I don't throw banana peel or, or citrus, I don't like that. But, and you don't put any meat in there, but you can put uh, egg shells because the calcium is good for the balance of the nutrients in the compost. So worm castings are one of the most um, healthier uh, types of compost. And you can make compost tea when you, the, it needs to keep moist, so when you pour water through there, if you have a uh, spigot or something that the water can come out the bottom, you can collect that worm tea and that can be used to water plants, house plants or outdoor plants. Um, other healthy practices, or you can call it best management practice, lawn best management practices. Let leaves de decompose naturally into lawn. So I know I see most people rake up their leaves. I don't rake up my leaves, I mow over them and let them decompose over the winter. It, it's a nice mulch. And it's the, a lot of the natives have uh, evolved to um, be used to having a slow release of nutrients from um, oak tree leaves, for example, and maple leaves. 
So it's good to leave them. And then what I noticed this spring is it, it looked ugly for only about a couple of days. It looked ugly when the residual uh, partially decomposed leaves were on the surface of my lawn. But after the first rain, you couldn't even see the leaves. After the first rain, they, they pretty much broke down, dissolved into the ground. Uh, another thing you could do is if you really don't like that look, you can rake up the leaves and compost them. So you're adding it back, but you're, you're blending it with other things and, and adding it back to the lawn. And again, kind of uh, repeating myself, consider native, uh, plant, native plants. Commit more land to garden slowly over time and reduce the size of your lawn. And perennials are good because perennials, as opposed to annuals, come back for years without replanting. It's very nice to have less work to do when you plant perennials. Question? Do pine needles have any value for uh, You know what? I do not uh, compost the pine needles. Uh, they can inhibit the breakdown of certain things. I've, I mean, some people do add, I've heard some people do add pine needles to their compost. I don't. I let the pine needles stay where they are in the forest. Yeah. Yeah, there's certain things that certain things that uh, you can use them for or not. And uh, perennials, uh, it's something to consider that our food system relies a lot on annuals, and that's a lot of, of energy and time and resources that are used for that. And the future of agriculture feeding a growing population on this planet may come down to um, doing some real research and, and work on on perennials that can feed us as opposed to annuals. So a lot of the grains, we're a grain-based agriculture. When humans first uh, started agricultural practices, they were fighting against nature and they were, and their diets, anthropologists tell us that they actually became, humankind actually became less healthy and were stunted in their growth, had bad teeth, died of cardiovascular and other diseases at a younger age and we're actually healthier as a hunter-gatherer society, according to anthropologists. So the, it's the diversity of food, having a diversity of different foods, eating, relying more on perennials that are less, take less, consume less resources, uh, might be uh, what, what the human species needs so we don't see a crash in population. Uh, the other thing in your lawn is you can uh, grow short herbaceous plants instead of as ground cover instead of traditional grasses. So you can play around with some different species of grasses. Uh, if it's growing too wild looking, it might your neighbors may not be very happy. So one strategy is to make it look controlled. So you can have plots or sh different shapes of different plants. It, it should look landscaped. It should have a, a kind of a controlled landscape look about it that you are designing the landscape rather than having it just grow completely wild. It, then if you do that and it looks more controlled, you can pretty much get away with growing what you want. For watering, I just got myself a rain barrel finally. You can collect water and use rain water um, when it's dry. We re I rely a lot on Michigan rain. Michigan produces a lot of rain. And again, if you're using native plants, They've adapted to the rainfall because the rainfall patterns may be changing with climate change. <laughs> so it's good to have uh, some ability to um, control water. Um, you can uh, develop a swale and berm that's like ditches and, and mounds, swales and berms to store and move water on your property to different plants because different plants have different water needs. That's something that we would have to study and how you can get companion plants to work together to um, f fuel the hydrologic cycle and to supply, um, draw different pr uh, insects in so that you can have a balance of predator-prey relationship in a biological control situation. So if that, it ta takes a lot of knowledge. It actually takes a lot of some knowledge but if you're aware of it, you can look up most of the stuff on the internet. So if you're aware that there are this, this concept of companion plants, that you know I can grow things side by side that will draw different insects. And monoculture is the worst. If you have one species of anything, whether it's grass or corn or, what, or soy or whatever, one species of plant will draw pests that eat that one thing, and you'll have a, a plague of insects feasting on that monoculture. Nature doesn't do that. Nature has biodiversity. Nature uh, has a high biodiversity so that it keeps 
any one pest in control. So you may have heard of things like corn gluten for weed control. That works on the principle of uh, nitrogen phosphorus. And, but it um, can kill good species too, like your um, uh, clover. So that's not a, uh, necessarily something you want to use. Uh, everything, choices we make have consequences and a little bit of knowledge can be a dangerous thing. And I know it's a lot of effort. It's a lot of effort to learn how to, to grow things organically and how to uh, get, get, grow a diverse uh, plants in your yard is a lot, may take more effort than using the traditional approach of just dumping fertilizer and pesticide to keep a green grass or hiring a, a um, lawn care company to use chemicals to keep your turf lawn. It's going to take a little bit more work and a little bit more scientific understanding but it's well worth it from the benefits that you as a person will get and what you're contributing to the earth. Uh, you might have heard of other things like boric acid, diatomaceous earth, or drying agents. Again, they're nonspecific, so you're, um, if you're trying to kill a certain pest, you have to be aware that there may be uh, effects on uh, beneficial insects as well. And benefic beneficial insects are really taking a hit. Our pollinators, this is serious business, like bees, the decline of bees is um, debatable. A lot of people believe that it's the um, pesticides, especially systemic pesticides in France. They show that when they banned systemic pesticides, the bees made a comeback very quickly. Um, but the industry probably does not want to hear that. They're still on this theory that there's a specific mite or a specific virus or, or some one biological agent, which I don't believe. I believe there's many different uh, pests and that if the immune system of an organism is impaired, they're going to be more, more vulnerable to these pests. So we have to keep uh, our pollinating insects healthy as well as ourselves. Um, another thing is uh, people say, well, I don't know if I can grow all this stuff in my yard because the deer will just eat it. And I have that problem as well. Um, there are things that can be done, and that's always going to be true. So. I kind of have a uh, say la vie attitude, but uh, plant a lot of um, onions on the outer perimeter, uh, grow extra food for the wildlife, and then try to hide your edibles in. <laughs> Basically, you know. And then um, another thing that you can do is um, plant, um, you can always fence things, you know, grow fruit and nut trees and try to fence them off while they're growing. I've seen at Oakland University what they do is they put uh, PVC pipe around the trunk of trees to keep the deer from chewing on the bark, whatever works. So uh, a mantra that is becoming popular among environmentalists these days is less is more. Less is best or less is more. Less chemical use provides more biodiversity for the ecosystems, more food for pollinating insects, more food for wildlife, more, more food for yourself. The other thing you have to think about is all these chemicals and modern farming practices where, you, um, where the food is growing in a concentrated feed lots is really, in my view, unethical. It's, it's not pleasant, it's not good for the animals. Animals are supposed to be out foraging. And if we all started growing little bits of food, whatever food you can grow and eat locally, you save a lot of resources. And you're making a choice with your pocketbook again. You're buying, if you buy the meat from the factory farm, you're making a choice. You're saying that I'm not bothered by that, that it's okay. You're condoning it. So you're making a choice with your pocketbook. Permaculture is an ecological ecosystem approach to growing food, but it's more than that. It's, it's fostering wildlife, it's capturing uh, energy and water. It's an ecosystem approach to your landscaping of your own yard would be uh, described in such books as Food Not Lawns or Gaia's Garden or Edible Forest Gardens. And then um, two really good um, authors of textbooks of permaculture are Dave Holmgren and Bill Molson. They're from Australia. And what to change first? I was told by a permaculturist that planting fruit and nut trees is something you want to start with because trees are very good for the hydrologic cycle. They store water. 
they take a long time to grow, but then there's little maintenance and they provide a large yield. Once they're fruiting, once they, you get the fruits and nuts from a mature uh, growing tree, it's, it's a huge uh, pounds of food that's produced just from a few plants versus if you're doing um, annuals, if you're planting, uh, th uh, most people like to plant a garden with tomatoes and carrots and those kinds of things and you have to do a lot of labor for a little bit of food. So a food nut tree is something good to start. Plus you're feeding your kids and grandkids and that tree hopefully will stay for a long, will grow for a long time and continuously produce food for the next generation. Another thing a lot of people don't know is that nitrogen-based fertilizers are made from natural gas. And natural gas is, for the most part, a non-renewable resource, just like oil. You can get, uh, it's methane. Methane you can get from um, decomposition of organic matter in nature or um, from landfills. So you can always get, you'll always have some methane being produced. But a lot of the huge uh, stores of methane that we use for our fertilizers and for heating our homes is we mine out of the ground. You've heard of fracking. Fracking has become popular. And there, that whole thing came up because some of the easier uh, stores of methane have already been sucked out of the ground. And now we're going to get the uh, bits that were hard to get out in the first place, the stuff that didn't come out very easily in the first place. We're adding uh, water and chemicals to try to, like a slurry, to try to get that little bit of gas out. And that's really um, spreading a lot of toxins into the earth. And even though they say it doesn't get into the groundwater, we know differently if you saw Gasland. Anybody seen the documentary Gasland? You can see about that. But also just the fact that it's, for the most part, an unsustainable resource, that we're using a resource. I think if you're using fertilizers to grow food, uh, this is called the Green Revolution, rapid production of food, usually by monoculture methods. At least you're producing food for people to eat. But it's really almost inexcusable when you think about a valuable resource like this fertilizer to be used for growing a lawn, especially since you grow up the grass, then you cut it, and then you want to get rid of that. And what gets me is that people, they can't seem to want to grow their grass fast enough. You know, like, you know I'd rather, if I have to mow once every two weeks, I'd rather mow every two weeks than, than once a week. So why would I want the grass to grow? faster. Maybe that's just me. Maybe uh, maybe because it's greener. And like I said, in Michigan, we don't usually need a lot of phosphorus. We don't usually have phosphorus deficient soils. And phosphorus is mined. And if you want to read about the environmental impact of phosphorus mines, you know, again, you're using valuable resource that's needed for food production and you're for growing grass. And then um, and there's environmental impacts of that mining operation as well. So uh, there's a real question as to how the human population can be sustained, and if we're squandering our resources for this activity, that's in the future is going to seem insane. When it's true that growth of lawns and biofuels is in direct competition for the resources that we need to grow food, that's a fact. Now, types of chemicals and their toxicity. Uh, some of the fertilizers contain heavy metals. Uh, herbicides, atrazine is a bad one, it's an endocrine disruptor, uh, banned in some European countries, not the United States. And uh, this is sort of a, some people might find as a joke, but I'm serious here. If you have time to apply a poison, try weeding instead. Mm -hmm. it seems crazy, but I have a big yard and I just, the weeds I don't want, I weed by hand. And the other ones, like dandelions, I don't even consider weeds. I consider them beneficial plants. And you might have heard of carbamates and organophosphates. Those are neurotoxins by design. Even though there's differences between insects and humans, there's a lot of similarity. So how can you expect it to have an effect on one organism and not have an effect on us? And it's not just for the effects that we already know about, but there's always effects that we don't know about. How many chemicals have been on the market where it's taken years before we really understand, fully understand their effects, and then they end up getting banned? So I take the precautionary principle, why should I use a chemical if I don't really need to? Try alternatives before resorting to that. And the chlorinated and brominated organic chemicals um, are 
some of them are endocrine disruptors. They bioaccumulate and biomagnify through the food chain. So that means that the, they will concentrate in your body and they stay there for very, years, maybe your whole lifetime. You'll have residues of this chemical, especially if you're exposed on a regular basis, which we all are. And then they get into the food chain and the organisms at the top of the food chain have some of the higher concentrations. Uh, so bad that there have been uh, seals and whales that have been caught there where their carcasses would not be allowed to be disposed of N normally. They'd be declared hazardous waste at <clears throat> 50 parts per million or more of organochlorine residues. This was from pest beyondpesticide.org. Of 30 commonly used lawn pesticides, 16 are toxic to birds, 24 are toxic to fish and aquatic organisms, and 11 are deadly to bees. So as a beekeeper, I really don't, you know, I'm, I wonder why I'm struggling to keep bees in suburbia. Where are they going? I can't tell them not to go in my neighbor's yard. So I appreciate if you kind of limit the chemicals. And I'm going to talk about a specific chemical, one of the most widely used one, uh, glyphosate. And the reason why is that I'm, I'm always very surprised that so many people believe that the chemical glyphosate or Roundup and Rodeo or some of the commercial names have, uh, is completely safe, has no toxicity whatsoever. And I know um, the lo local land conservancy and other groups that use this, and they really do believe there's absolutely nothing wrong with this chemical. They've been indoctrinated with the belief that there's no toxicity. Free lunch, huh? No free lunch. Now, just look at this first slide. Acute toxicity in humans. You can commit suicide by drinking it. So if I say there's absolutely no toxicity, a mere cup of this stuff uh, is highly deadly toxic. So three-fourths of a cup is a lethal threshold. Death within the first hour, cardiac shock, multiple organ failure, pulmonary edema, you can't breathe, fluids are in your lungs, and it destroys red blood cells. And there have been a, a few of these cases of, in India particularly, farmers are committing suicide because they can't make a living with the seeds that they've been sold, that they've been told that if you buy these seeds uh, that contain systemic pesticides or, or, or Roundup resistant, that they will have huge yields and they will make a lot of money and, and then they find out, oops, it's not as good as it's cracked up to be. And so there have been a lot of cases of death by glyphosate. So right there I'd say, well, in terms of acute toxicity, anything that where I only have to drink a few swallows, I'm going to be in the hospital, doesn't sound good to me. Then there are cases of people applying the pesticide and if you, you just like you don't, you know what, in the wind, uh, you don't spray pesticides in the wind. You, you spray down so the pesticide moves downwind and if you don't, you get a, it flashes back into your face, which happened to this guy and he was hospitalized and did have permanent lung scarring. Mm. Well, you know, you hope it gets diluted by then, but if you get a splash right in your face, it's pretty bad. Uh, the other thing is the molecule glyphosate. I don't know how many of you have taken organic chemistry, but there's a glycine molecule and a phosphate in moiety. And the, some of the amino acids are what's called excitotoxins. And there's a question about, is glyphosate an excitotoxin? This was a journal article in Movement Disorders. And a Parkinsonian symptom, symptoms like Parkinson's and lesions appeared on a 54-year-old man exposed during the spraying when the wind it sprayed back in his face. And there have been documented cases of people with neurological effects, and there's a, a plausible connection to this, what's called the NMDA receptor-mediated pathway. At micromolar concentrations, Glyphosate has been cause, uh, shown to cause oxidative stress in human skin cells, which, okay, the skin may be reversible with antioxidant treatments, if you knew about it, but most of us, if we're exposed, we may not even know how much we're exposed to it. And it can, it's been shown to cause short-term eye and skin irritation even from a single application. These are a bunch of journal articles. I wanted to get to the heart of it of, you know, when people really believe that glyphosate is completely safe and has no toxicity whatsoever, 
Um, there are many documented journals, and some of them are quite recent. So every year, more and more articles are coming out. This is what I said about the precautionary principle. You want to minimize the use of chemicals because all chemicals have effect on the body. They have some toxicity, and we don't want to find out later. We also don't know what is the effect of multiple mixtures of chemicals. We're, we're constantly being exposed to chemicals in our air, food, water. And when we mix these different chemicals, what does that do to the system? So we don't want to find out later. So uh, these are just um, more and more documented cases of sub-lethal, sub-acute, or chronic conditions that can result from exposure to glyphosate, including um, direct effect on the cells. And even at residues that are common in food. So um, one thing that the manufacturer would say is that the residues in food, if we grow uh, glyphosate-resistant plants like soy, corn, and we pour glyphosate to kill all weeds and that plant is resistant to it, but you're dumping a huge amount of glyphosate on the plant, then of course there's going to be some residual glyphosate on the food product. Well, the manufacturer would say, but those residues are so low that they're non toxic. But there are articles already saying that at concentrations that correspond to these food residues, we're seeing uh, cell death. And uh, the other thing about uh, glyphosate, some of these products that contain glyphosate, they have different formulations. And the formulation is, are additives, adjuvants that the glyphosate is mixed together with and it changes the toxicity and bioavailability of the chemical. So the chemical has its own toxicity, but then when you mix it with other chemicals, it can greatly enhance the toxicity of the total product. And it's interesting that, that one of the formulations, if you, just, if you test it in that formulation, it causes a certain type of cell death called apoptosis. But if, you, if the glyphosate alone cause necrosis, that there's two types of cell death. One is necrosis and the other is apoptosis. And it just goes on and on, subacute toxicity in rats. Now this is a high LD50, meaning it takes an awful lot of glyphosate to outright kill a rat. If you inject into the abdomen, low doses, it decreases the activity of certain enzymes. So the, the outright lethality might take a lot of chemical, but at very low doses, you can start to see enzyme effects on the organism. And what that means is that these enzymes break down other toxins. So you may stimulate or decrease the amount of enzyme upon exposure of one chemical that then affects the body's ability to break down or bioactivate other chemicals. And then also, um, there are different routes of exposure. So ingesting may cause one type of effect, and then breathing in, if, if the rat inhales the glyphosate, only uh, one-tenth of the dose that would give um, an oral toxicity would give toxicity via inhalation, including pulmonary edema. So what I said before is some of the, some of the adjuvants or additives in a the commercial mixtures that use glyphosate may contain surfactants that make the chemical get into the cell. It makes the chemical much more bioavailable than it would ordinarily be. This is how, I brought this up because people will ask me, well, I've been told this stuff is safe and it has been tested, to some degree it has been tested and it's not that bad. Now you're telling me that it's toxic. Well. One of the tricks of the trade, in, I don't know if the industry did this on purpose or it's just um, incidental, but they test the chemical, the, the active ingredient glyphosate alone. And the toxicity of that chemical alone is quite different than when it's mixed in with its surfactants. I would have to think they would know that. I would have to think that you know that the surfactant, the surfactant is actually added for a reason to make it more bioavailable to plant cells. But it's also going to make it more bioavailable to human and other animal cells. So to me, I would have to think that they know that they're testing the chemicals separately. You're going to get much less of a result than when you add the surfactant. Yes? When they first went to that system, I remember talking to the ag boys and telling me that dirt ingredients were 
some of the nerd ingredients. Well, now DDT is banned, but yeah. Oh, okay. Inert ingredients. Well, that's not inert, but it's a pesticide. You know, it's inert from the standpoint of an herbicide because this is an herbicide. DDT is a pesticide. Aha. Uh -huh. Right. So little tricks of the trade. So. Um, the risk assessments also, initial risk assessments of the chemical were based on the parent compound without these adjuvants. So that's one way they can get away with, skirt around the issue and say, oh, it's not that bad. If you look up the EPA risk assessment on the IRIS database, all the references for toxicology studies were older ones that um, when Monsanto created the product, that were, um, well, the other thing is testing. If the company that makes the chemical is doing the testing, it's, to me, it's a conflict of interest. And they could say, well, we're, uh, we're up on board with this, but um, who knows? Um, I don't trust it. I, think, I always think there should be a third-party analysis to validate whether it's a problem or not. And the other thing is some of the, the earliest studies were even found to be corrupt. And that's, we're going to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, and that's surprising, yeah. So the other thing is um, you look at the oral RFD, the no effects level is 10 milligrams per kilogram per day, causes kidney damage. To me, that's, that's actually um, a viable dose. What I mean by that is it is plausible that people might be exposed to these levels. I mean, even without drinking it to commit suicide outright, if you inhale it, you could inhale milligram quantities per kilogram of body weight, conceivably, if you were a, a occupational, if you used it in terms of occupational setting, spraying and stuff. What is no level um, No observed effect level, no observed effects. The level, the concentration below which there's no observed effect, above that level is toxic. Um, it's not considered a carcinogen, that's another question, that, that some studies say it's weakly mutagenic, other studies are saying it's not a mutagen. A mutagen is also a carcinogen because a mutagen mutates DNA and cancer is a series of mutations. So some studies have said yes, it's weakly mutagenic and it's shown to cause facial defects in rodents at high doses and it's shown to cause sperm defects in rats relevant to occupational exposures. Uh, hello, men. I think this is, uh, we should pay attention to this if you ever want to have children, and who knows what else. And these are reputable journals, like toxicology letters. Uh, white blood cells, lymphocyte cultures treated with glyphosate without adjuvant, so it's probably worse if you add the additive, exhibited a linear increase of dose on micronuclei, nuclear, it's, these are just different endpoints of toxicity. It goes on and on. I did this to show that more and more research is coming out to show that there's effects directly on DNA, directly on cells, directly on tissues. And so the question is, is glyphosate a human carcinogen? I don't think the jury's out on that. Uh, there's one paper that says, suggests that, the, that the, if you mix certain chemicals with glyphosate, it may contribute to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Well, as you know, if there's little testing done on chemicals, and what testing there is is an isolation of other chemicals. They don't test chemical mixtures. Well, if the chemical is weakly mutagenic, but it's implicated, it may be implicated in cancer, what, then that seems like a contradiction. So we'd have to understand the mechanism of, of toxicology. <laughs> That's not easy to see why that might be. And then it's clear that the chemical is cytotoxic, so killing cells outright can, when the body tries to repair itself, increases the probability of cancer. So it could be more aptly called, that's called with, uh, cancer promoter rather than carcinogen, but it's not clear yet. First of all, we don't test chemicals directly on humans. There may be cases where people are accidentally exposed. So most of the human uh, doc the effects on humans that are documented were accidental or that suicide cases. Um, children, um, there have been some studies with children, but yeah, they're, they're not going to consider um, effects if they can get away with it. Just like um, some of the systemic pesticides that are killing off bees, and in France, when they banned the chemicals, 
the bees made a full recovery within a year, and so the chemicals were implicated. That they said that, that the chemicals were not at all toxic to adult bees, and the chemical industry was not required to test the chemical on bee larvae. Uh -huh. Yeah, bee larvae. They were not required to test. They tested on adult bees. So their neurological systems are already formed. They may be affected, but not like a developing embryo. So it's, that's another thing. And um, for me, I think having a knowledge of toxicology, I want to be able to affect the world and educate people, inform people. But for myself, it's been valuable because I've, I feel like I can make better choices in my life of what I eat, the, how I treat the water that I drink, or um, what chemicals I may or may not use. Having an understanding of the toxicology is very useful. So I, um, back to this, um, that was kind of an aside, back to this issue of how they mixed the surfactants after, uh, separately with the compound in, and, and when you mix them, they become much more toxic. So there's now a new field of study looking at the effect of mixtures on uh, wildlife. And some of these species, like Xenopus is a frog, 2.6 milligrams per liter in water will kill uh, fish embryos in a single application. And there are some fish that are so sensitive, even a milligram per liter can kill them. And then it's widely variable because fathead minnow, a thousand times more, has no effect. So difference, there's a bunch of data on different species, um, including earthworms, and more and more information is coming out all the time that shows that there's a wide variety so if, of effects at, at, for a given dose. So if you, did your, if you did any studies and you happen to pick species that aren't very sensitive, you might think that it's not so bad, and then you find some very, very sensitive species that can be wiped out with a very small, with a single application of this stuff. The other thing, as you probably heard of, is that um, a lot of plants are becoming resistant to glyphosate, so then you're going to have to develop more potent uh, chemicals to do the job, so that the whole approach to chemicals um, is futile, in my view. And in France, I talked about systemic pesticides being banned. They also um, sued, Monsanto was sued in France on the basis that Roundup was supposed, to, it breaks down quickly and leaves the soil clean. That's another uh, misinformation that the, the Roundup disappears overnight. You, most people really believe that if I spray this, it's gone the next day. But look at the half-life. Half-life doesn't mean it's gone. It means the concentration goes down by half in that amount of time. And that amount of time can be weeks. So one has to look at all these different issues. And you can see where the lack of requirement of testing or selective type of testing or outright lies and propaganda can lead people to believe that there's no problem at all with these chemicals when in fact there is. I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>